welcome to our first event in our spring series, Schooling in Mass Society. Now the separating or separate setting apart of teacher training and of ed schools and ed programs from both liberal arts colleges and from the research activities of our academic disciplines, this emerged at the very onset of the massification of higher education in the United States at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. This separation has had many effects or ripples over, over time. Almost certainly, this separation has limited recruitment into K-12 teaching, and indeed, it may well have contributed to defining K-12 teaching as a lower status and lower paid profession. So too, it has meant that history and the social science disciplines have done much less scholarly research on schooling as a social phenomenon than they should have, given how central mass schooling is to the character of modern societies. One might add that the failure of scholars in these disciplines to do research on and to offer courses about schooling has fostered and even courted a lack of self-awareness in higher education about the social effects of our own institutions and activities. This semester's NCSI event series, Schooling in Mass Society, is designed to disturb and work through that separation. It does so by pursuing a dialogue between the scholarly investigation of schooling as a social phenomenon on the one hand, and policy debates about schools and classrooms on the other. It is thus fitting that we begin our series with Jonathan Zimmerman. Professor Zimmerman is arguably our preeminent historian of education, domestically and internationally, in relation to US history. His work on schooling has yielded important insights into such long-standing concerns of American historians as ideologies of American exceptionalism and US practices of global imperialism. In addition, Professor Zimmerman has produced a usable history of schooling usable both for teachers and for public policy debates about schooling. Consistent with this, Professor Zimmerman is a prolific author of op-ed pieces, as well as a series of important books, including Innocence Abroad, American Teachers in the American Century, published in 2006, Who's America? <coughs> Culture Wars in the Public Schools, published in 2005, and Distilling Democracy, Alcohol Education, in America's Public Schools, published in 1999. And in terms of the op-ed pieces, let me just encourage you um, to read the LA Times tomorrow for his um, appreciation and response to the passing of Sergeant Shar Shriver. Um, and that will be in the op-ed section of the LA Times tomorrow. Of the many important threads in Jonathan Zimmerman's work, I want to highlight a point he foregrounds that we in higher education have too often disregarded, in my opinion. This point is the extent to which codified forms of secular knowledge that we teach leave our classrooms with our students and then move out and about in the world, always in complex and uneven ways. Zimmerman's Innocence Abroad, for instance, shows how college graduates who taught abroad in the second half of the 20th century, as he himself did in Nepal for two years, took with them and acted upon versions of the culture concept that had emerged first in Boazian anthropology at the very beginning of the 20th century. Put simply, Zimmerman's work is cutting edge scholarship on the impact of teaching, of secular knowledge on the world, just as it is cutting edge scholarship on how actually existing forms of globalization have entered into the lives of diverse persons around the world. Now before welcoming Jonathan Zimmerman, I want to note that our pursuit of these and related issues will continue throughout the semester, and let me in particular announce our next two MCSI schooling events. On Tuesday, the 1st of February at 4.15, we will have a panel discussion on leading issues in historical research on schooling, featuring two valued colleagues from CS CMC, Professors Nita Kumar and Diana Selleck. And then on February 8th, we host Jonathan Zimmerman's NYU colleague, Pedro Nogueira, who is the author of the very important work, The Trouble with Black Boys and Other Reflections on Race, Equality, and the Future of Public Education. Today, Jonathan Zimmerman will speak to us about his new research on sex education, 
His lecture is titled, The Birds, the Bees, and the World, How Sex Education Encircled the Globe. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Zimmerman. This is the book that I'm still sketching out, and everything I'm going to say is very provisional. Um, it'll probably be different tomorrow. I'm, I'm in what I'd like to call the romance stage of this project, where everything is great. You know, you just fall in love. You know, yeah. She likes blueberry pancakes, and I like blueberry pancakes, and we're in love. And they yeah, haven't gone to that kind of sober second part. Um, so I'm, just, I'm, 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 going, I'm going with it. Um, I try to describe to you um, I, I, what I'm thinking, and especially what surprised me thus far. Um, when I give a talk, I, I, I like to structure it around the surprises because I think that that's really, uh, well, frankly, where, where the excitement of intellectual work comes from. I know this will sound very weird. It is weird, but my, my mom was a sex educator. Is that, it's weird. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, one of, the things that, one of the things that I, quote, learned from her was that the United States was very retrograde. Uh, in its sex ed and needed to catch up to the rest of the world, um, especially to Europe. Um, and uh, that actually is not true. And my first surprise is that the United States was actually a pioneer of, of global sex education, um, both uh, its idea and its delivery uh, before the Second World War. That's surprise number one. And I'll come, to, come back to each of these. Um, surprise number two is that after the Second World War, it, it was it was challenged by a different model of sex ed, developed, yes, in Scandinavia and then elsewhere in continental uh, Europe. It was based not on the consequences um, of, of, uh, uh, of sex or sexual behavior, but actually on individual rights. Individual rights. It was a completely different model. Part of mom's idea is that there's kind of one way to do sex ed and we're behind. But my second surprise is actually that the ideas that the Scandinavians put forth and promulgated around the world represented a, substanti a, a substantively different form of sex education that I'll try to describe to you. And then lastly, um, in the so-called third world, post-AIDS, which as you might guess changes everything, the last surprise is that the American model turns out to be more, if you will, culturally appropriate than the European model. Um, uh, I spent uh, um, six months teaching in Ghana about two years ago, and George W. Bush was a very popular figure there um, uh, for a lot of reasons, but one had to do with his um, uh, family planning and AIDS policies. Um, uh, and I think that's because the American model fit better there. Um, that doesn't mean it's right uh, or even good. Um, uh, but for somebody schooled by mom, or at least by mom by my mom, uh, it does represent a kind of surprise. So those are the three surprises. Um, I think it might be it might be useful, and I don't want to I don't want to talk for more than say 35 minutes because uh, after that everybody goes to sleep. Um, uh, but it, it might be useful just to describe what U.S. sex education was briefly um, uh, in the early 20th century because surprise number one is that it was a pioneer. So what was it? Um, well. Uh, in the United States, sex education began in cities like Chicago and New York around 1900 uh, when there were venereal disease outbreaks. Um, uh, venereal disease outbreaks were closely related to prostitution. Very simply, what happened was middle class men patronized prostitutes, went home, and infected their wives. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, it, it stepped up in the 1920s when automobile uh, use um, of every kind stepped up. Uh, if there is a God, I don't think that he or she decreed that millions of Americans would have their first sexual experience in an automobile, uh, but uh, that is what happened. Um, uh, and, yeah, read, read Middletown. I mean, read the Lynn's book about Middletown. It's all about uh, kids getting it on in cars. Um, uh, and and um, uh, sex ed develops as a way to try to control this, and by this I mean specifically um, uh, uh, youth sexual behavior um, and the transmission of venereal disease. The idea is that if we teach knowledge, um, uh, that people will act on it in socially constructive and positive ways. This lay at the heart of almost every progressive idea or ideal. Um, and the pioneer here was the American Social Hygiene Association, now known as the American Social Health Association. But here's a typical ASHA appeal. Quote, guidance of sex impulses by reason, consideration, and social welfare, rather than by impulse and self-gratification. 
This is our goal. By consideration of social welfare, not impulse and self-gratification. Um, uh, progressivism took its, its uh, uh, most notorious and to us most odious form in the science of eugenics. And remember, that was a credentialed science 100 years ago. And it was a classic prog progressive science. Um, uh, use knowledge um, to get people to behave in publicly spirited and publicly appropriate ways. Uh, in this case, um, uh, um, to make better race. Uh, and here's a sex educator, same time period, 1920. We must look towards hygiene and eugenics as affording our sole hope for race betterment so that when young people meet, they'll avoid unquestioning, blind, love at first sight. Eugenics will teach a rational sex ethics. And here's my favorite quote. Individualism in sex relation means chaos. <laughs> right? Don't just think about yourself. Okay? Think about all of us. Right? And the consequences of your act for all of us. Um, now, it's controversial from the beginning. We didn't invent the controversy, and there are many opponents to this. Um, uh, uh, there are working class opponents, often uh, rooting their objection in religion. Uh, in Chicago, uh, working class Catholics rioted against sex education. Um, and here's the argument, quote, what motive or sanction can the teacher of sex hygiene give for his teaching? What can he teach other than hygiene is as good as the Ten Commandments? and that disinfectants are an excellent substitute for the moral code, right? They don't object, of course, to sexual continence, right? They rather like it, okay? They object to the effort to try to use this new science, such as it was, to promote it, uh, rather than you know, scripture and moral argument. Um, then there's a kind of literary, kind of upper class objection, which is that this is just kind of crude and impolite. Um, uh, Agnes Rutley wrote this famous uh, essay called Repeal of Reticence, and it's all about how evil <laughs> sex ed is. Sex ed isn't an antidote to this kind of new youth sexuality. It's just a fruit of it. It's more bad stuff. Quote, the lack of restraint, the lack of balance, the lack of soberness were never more apparent than the obsession of sex, which has set us all a babbling about matters once excluded from polite conversation. Um, uh, and uh, then there's also um, uh, uh, a kind of skeptic satirist objection, which, like all skeptic satirist objections, begins with H.L. Mencken. Um, uh, Mencken uh, wrote several hilarious articles condemning sex ed. Um, one of the things he pointed out is that the sex ed books talk a lot about the dangers of VD, but don't tell you how people have sex. Um, uh, so how do you avoid this danger if you're not being told how people have sex? They would have all these illustrations about animals and kind of plants fertilizing each other. Um, and, 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 and somehow the kids are supposed to abstract from that about what people do or not. And so Mencken writes, um, the books are full of evasions. He's looking at sex ed books. They are pious rubbish. They start off with attempts to show that the phenomena of sex in the lower organisms, usually herring or frogs, are beautiful and instructive. And they close with horrible warnings about the phenomena of sex in man. I do not forget their frequent high praise of maternity, their florid descriptions of the joys of philo -progen uh, progenity. But maternity, as they picture it, is scarcely more sexual than playing the piano. It is, in fact, antisexual. First, they describe romantically the mating of the lilies and the June bugs. Then they plunge furiously into the revolting treatises upon kissing games, necking, and the dance. Uh, and then he goes on and he says, sexual experience, as is depicted in these books, is either something quite inert, like getting one's hair cut, or something horrible and dangerous, like bullfighting. <laughs> there is, on the one hand, the chaste automatic philandering of the rose and the honeybee. There is, on the other hand, the appalling pathological fate of sinful homo sapiens. Um, I wish I could write like that. So that's some, something to shoot for. Um, uh, in the 1950s, after the, the Second World War, um, sex ed would take on a different name in this country, and actually euphemism is going to be at the heart of my book because um, we call it many different things for many different reasons. But it becomes family life education. Because, of course, in the Cold War, um, uh, family lies at the center of a lot of domestic rhetoric. Women are leaving the workforce. They're getting married uh, younger, and everyone's having lots of babies. Um, uh, GIs come back from the war, and you know they, they uh, buy a home and start a family in about seven minutes. Um, uh, and, and really, I mean, outside the University of Minnesota, they, they, they had dorms called Fertile Acres. Uh, it's, 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 all, it's all vets and their, their new families. Um, uh, uh, and... Um, 
sex ed changes because there's more explicit discussion of, of, of sex, of the act, um, a new discussion of gender roles, but sex is still a dangerous force reserved for marriage. Part of the emphasis on family is actually channeling sexual behavior into family, that is, into the marital bond. Uh, if you ever see the movie Heavy Petting, which I strongly recommend, um, you, you'll, you'll see a lot of the sex ed of the time in florid detail. Um, people like David Byrne uh, remembering the lessons that they had, which included you know, how to behave on a date. Uh, and how do, how do you behave on a date? Well, don't lead him on, um, because you don't want something bad to happen. Um, uh, that's the 50s. Moving quickly into the 1960s, sex ed becomes a hugely contested and contentious issue. Um, and yet, one of the things I'm going to argue is that the left and the right actually agree in a sense because they're both still focused on consequences. How do we prevent these bad consequences? Um, and, you know, we know what they are, right? They're VD, and then later, obviously, AIDS. Um, and they're uh, unwanted pregnancy. Uh, and, and nobody really questions the idea that that's the goal. The debate is how to, how to get there. Um, uh, so there is a new sexual openness and frankness that some people call the sexual revolution. And you've got Margaret Mead, of all people, calling for a new kind of sex ed. She says, today's adults didn't grow up learning to talk about such things to children. Schools must step into the breach to prevent these consequences. Uh, schools have to get into this act to prevent the ill consequences. The key figure in all of this is a fascinating person named Mary Calderon. Um, and uh, uh, Calderon, her father was Edward Steichen, who's a famous progressive era photographer. She went to medical school in the 30s, which not too many women did, was later a big figure in Planned Parenthood. Um, in the family planning movement, but decided that the real problem had to do with ideas and attitudes about sexuality and founded this organization called the Sexual Education and Information um, uh, uh, Commission of the United States, or SICA, still the leading sex ed organization in our country. Um, uh, and in the 1960s, Calderon is very active in calling for, again, more discussion, more talk about sex and sexuality in the schools, but the goal remains the same. The goal remains to prevent these odious consequences. Um, uh, but of course, a lot of people objected to the talk. And I, I, was, I was in um, uh, Calderon's uh, uh, manuscripts, or her, her letters, a couple weeks ago at, at Radcliffe. And it's just, it's 15, 15 boxes of vituperation. Um, she was a hugely vilified figure. You know, um, uh, I found that people sent, sent her rats. People sent her um, fecal matter, um, uh, really. Uh, and and um, I, I, I didn't open that part. Um, <laughs> uh, but but uh, he, here's, here's, a, here's a typical um, letter. God said about seducers of children, you'll wish you'd never been born. You'd be better off with a millstone or tied around your neck, cast in the depths of the sea. Drowning would be better than cast in the depths of hell, where, where you will have molten steel poured into you from two directions, and where your diet will be pus, Roaches, maggots, and spiders. Think about that tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, and here's another one. This one's really interesting. Um, uh, I'm 71 years old, love to work hard, try to have a purpose in life other than sex. <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, hate, hate dirty nude pictures. The body's far from beautiful when there are no clothes on it. God gave us sex to have children not to play around with the body. My brother had a business and still looked young at 65, a bachelor, no sex drives, too busy. Sex is to bear children if you want them. I had two and it was all I cared to have, but I wouldn't allow my husband to maul me to play around and we're both healthy. What makes you think your criterion is for every woman or man? Um, so it's interesting, I mean, Carl Deron sees herself as a person who's disciplining and channeling the sex revolution, but to her critics, she's the worst embodiment of it. Right? Um, I, I, she, she's corrupting innocent children. Um, now, AIDS changed everything. And I'm sure your professors have given you this rap before. I mean, it's very hard to understand. I mean, all of you were undergrads. You knew about AIDS from when you were six. Um, I, I, you have to understand, I mean, I went to Columbia College in the late 70s. And every year, I lived with somebody who's now dead. Um, and if you think about the history of the epidemic, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you, were, if you were a gay kid with some grades and some money, it made sense to go to New York City uh, in the late 70s, and no, nobody knew. Nobody knew. So AIDS changes everything. And in sex ed, what it did in this country, and I think around the world, 
is it made everybody for sex ed, right? It's just they want different kinds. During the Mary Calderon time, some people were for sex ed and other people were against it. Nobody's against sex education anymore. Phyllis Schlafly um, I, of, of the Eagle Forum favors sex ed. He favors this thing called abstinence only or sometimes teen respect. Um, but unlike prior critics who said that this dis discourse had no place in the schools, Schlafly doesn't say that. So um, that's, what, that's briefly the American story. Now let's get into the fun stuff. Um, I said the first surprise is the United <coughs> States is a pioneer, and I probably shouldn't have been surprised by that. Um, because the United States is a pioneer in secondary education. That is, we send more people to high school earlier than any other society. This is a series about you know, schooling and mass societies. Um, uh, you have to understand that the United States was really the, the I, I don't want to say the author, but certainly the pioneer of the mass high school. Um, by the 1930s, uh, um, over half of American teenagers go to a high school, and by the 1950s, over half graduate. Um, just to give you an illustration, I mean, in, in 1944, England passed this thing called the Education Act, uh, and that was an act to help people go to high school, right? Their GI Bill was to help people go to high school. Uh, uh, ours was to help people go to college, because millions were already going to high school. Um, because we're a pioneer of secondary education, we're also a pioneer of using the schools to teach sex ed. So there's a big international anti-VD movement starting around 1900, because the same things that are happening in Chicago and, and, and New York are duh, happening in Paris and Berlin and London. So there are big organizations with titles like International Union Against VD. Um, the Americans from the ASHA show up at these meetings and try to sell education. They say, hey, if we really want to fight venereal disease, let's do it in the schools. So not just law enforcement, which is, was a big theme in the other societies, and definitely not regulation. You know what that is, right? I mean, that's, that's, um, uh, that's what they have in parts of Nevada. All right? Um, uh, you know, that's where the state uh, um, you know, uh, uh, regulates, uh, controls and regulates prostitution. So they're arguing against that. But most of all, they're arguing for education. So the American Social Hygiene Association starts making films and sending them around the world. This is the part like, you know, I can't believe I get paid to do this because it was so amazing finding out about this and finding these ASHA films all over the world. Um, uh, you can't make up quotes like this, but here's from, uh, uh, here's an ASHA, ASHA um, uh, report from South America. Even in Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro, Manana becomes today when a social hygiene motion picture is to be exhibited. <laughs> Manana becomes today. Um, uh, at the American University in Cairo, I found the ASHA screening their movie, The Gift of Life. Um, the Egyptian host concluded with, quote, and I love this, three cheers for America and science. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Three cheers for America and science. And then um, a, a, a letter writer wrote, one man, dressed in European clothes, who took pride in speaking a little English, leaned over and said quite audibly for the writer to hear, America and science, the best of all. <laughs> now, this American method does emphasize science. Remember, as odious as we find it, eugenics was a science. Uh, there were people that got tenure, right, researching and writing about eugenics. That's not the only science involved here. Physiology is involved in some inchoate way psychology is. Um, uh, but when Americans show up at these European conferences, then the YMCA gets into this in the, in the 20s, um, uh, I found this fascinating report written by um, uh, uh, somebody at the conference, which was in Finland, uh, where this guy writes, the Americans thought we should follow scientific principles, while the Germans and Scandinavians felt that conscience and the Bible should be our guide. Like, we want to root all of this in science, in this thing called knowledge. And then, I love this, the American representatives seem particularly concerned about petting, especially mentioning this in connection with the habit of young couples going on long rides together in automobiles. <laughs> the European delegates did not understand what petting meant. <laughs> I sort of don't either. Good <laughs> right? I mean, still, I'm still a little confused by that. Um, uh, uh, so that's, that's pre-World War I. Um, then, then during the Cold War, and this gets weirder and even more fascinating, the, the era of family life education here, 
the United States starts promoting it overseas, um, mainly via organizations like the SHA. There's a little bit of State Department involvement in this. Um, but they give us a really interesting appeal about world relations. Listen to this. Family strength is world strength. We cannot build up an international organization like the United Nations unless the idealism behind it is one designed to convert the jangle of warring races into the family of man and the household of God. How can we extend the idea of family life to the whole world via the intimate experience of our own hearth side? That is the question of family life education. Wow. Um, I, I, the family of man, um, the intimate experience of our own hearth side. I could say a lot about that, I won't. Um, I, I, the, the, um, it isn't just this argument about kind of family and the family of nations. It's also the technique of voluntary organization. This too, the American voluntary organizations try to spread. So listen to this quote. The voluntary organization is the American contribution to sex education. And arguably that's true. Um, listen to this from 1945. Voluntary associations are essential to democracy. Hitler abolished the Rotary Club. <laughs> and, and if you've read about the Cold War, I mean, this is the time that, you know, a, a, a Tocqueville becomes <coughs> huge, right, in American letters, because the argument is, right, in the bad guys, there's just the individual and the state, right, but the good guys, there's this thing called civil society in between. Um, and this is a way to try to spread sex ed via civil society. And in occupied Germany and Japan, totally fascinating. Indeed, I found that um, MacArthur established social hygiene associations in Japan to try to press for sex ed. Um, and especially in Latin America, the United States um, promoted new national, nationwide social hygiene associations. Um, but that gets dicey too, because if we're promoting it, is it theirs, right? And listen to this. this is, you can only find this in private correspondence, um, because nobody would ever cop to this. But this one guy, Mer American Social Hygiene Association guy, is traveling around Latin America. He says, we're charged with imposing sex ed. I believe we can circumvent the charge. I agree certainly that the ideal approach would be built around strong national voluntary organizations which have been spontaneously <coughs> developed in each country. However, I think we can, in answer to the request of individuals in these countries, point out the need of a voluntary organization and give help that's requested in developing such a voluntary organization. In this way, we're not superimposing ourselves and our work would not be initiated from the international angle first. We would merely be answering requests from individuals and countries who see this need. So we're going through lots of contortions here, right? We understand that we're not supposed to be imposing this. The very idea of civil society is premised on the idea of some sort of organic growth of voluntary organizations. So what does it mean to promote them from the outside? Would they then be voluntary? Are they indigenous? OK. Um, uh, well. That's what Americans are doing. Meanwhile, in Europe, a different model is developing. And here comes my second surprise, right? Um, I thought there's one thing called sex ed. Well, there isn't. Um, there's the American version, and then the Southern version, which de actually does begin in Sweden. Some stereotypes are true, right? <laughs> there are Italian-American gangsters. They exist, OK? And yes, Sweden was the first country to require sex education nationwide. Um, I went to Sweden to do research over the summer, and I found out that they're hugely um, proud of this fact. Um, I, I, that it's, that it's, it's, kind of, it's a big deal in Sweden. Um, that, 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 um, although, of course, you know, as I argued in first surprise, the United States actually began this because we were sending more kids to school. In terms of national requirements, um, Sweden, was the, Sweden was the first. And almost everything that Americans say about Sweden and sex ed is wrong. Almost everything. Um, Sweden, for people in the sex business here, has just become a kind of <coughs> uh, this sort of free, free floating signifier um, uh, to let you put forward your, your own views, or at least project your own views. Um, so for people on the left, including Mary, uh, uh, Mary Calderon, um, it's utopia. Uh, this is Sika's quote Imagine a world where sex ed is compulsory, contraceptives readily available, abortion is free until the 18th week of pregnancy. Um, uh, teenage births and sexually transmitted diseases are rare. Sound too good to be true? That world exists today in Sweden. <laughs> All right, woohoo! All right, um, and then on the right, okay, 
Um, uh, uh, it's obviously the opposite. Um, uh, so, so this is uh, from a, 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 um, uh, a, a rabid anti-sex person in Orange County, California, circa 1968. Sweden has one of the highest suicide rates and one of the highest rates of alcoholism. Ditto for venereal disease. Do we not have to be insane to regard Sweden as anything but a tragic example of how sick a civilized society can become? Well, here's why they're both wrong. Um, they're both wrong because Swedish sex ed emphasizes not consequences, but individual rights. The individual right to sexual enjoyment and freedom. Um, uh, that's right. Uh, uh, that, that, um, there, there is a moral principle here, which is uh, kind of a Millsian utilitarian one. Don't do anything that hurts somebody else. All behavior should be chosen, not coerced. But most of all, that it should be pleasant and fun. So when I was in the archives in Sweden, and one of the great things about doing work in Sweden is because only nine million people speak that language, you know, like everything's in English. <laughs> uh, I, a, a real problem in doing this, um, uh, this project has turned out to be my own inadequacies uh, uh, in, in, in other languages other than English. Uh, I'm not alone in that, but just think about this. I mean, I'm a full professor at a major research university, and I basically have a working facility in one language. In what other country could that be true? Um, I, 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 people have told me in France, in some places, it is. Um, but I think that may be it. I would just be uneducated. I'm not proud of that, but that's where we are. Anyway, I'm in, I'm in the archives. And when you do work like this, sometimes you just hit it. Like, it, it, it is serendipitous. You know, everyone wants to think they've earned it, right? Uh, they haven't, right? There's a huge amount of luck involved in everything. Except for me, by the way. I, don't <laughs> I, I, was, I was a really good fetus, <laughs> right? And I earned, like, parents who loved and cared for me. You know, the other fetus is just sort of lay there, kind of suspended in her amniotic fluid, <laughs> sucking on the, on the, the teat of the nanny state. Um, I, I pulled myself up by my uh, or something. Uh, uh, I earned it. Every bit. Every bit. Uh, uh, but, but I just hit it on this one. Totally lucky, all right? I find a letter from a U.S. ally, very much like my mom, right? A letter saying, God, dear Mr. Sex Educator in Sweden, you really rock. You know, can you tell us like how much you rock and what we can do to rock, right? <laughs> and the guy in charge of the RFSU, which is a Swedish acronym for their National Sex Ed Organization, he writes back and he says, quote, thank you for your kind note, but I believe you have misunderstood us. We do not know if these positive figures, that is about VD and teen pregnancy, are due to sex education. That's the first thing, right? It's true. Right? He's like, okay, we do have lower rates than you in those areas, teen, preg teen pregnancy and, and, and uh, STDs. We don't know if that's because of sex ed. Um, and then he goes on and says, and moreover, that is not the point. <laughs> the fundamental reason for sex education, according to the Swedish view, is the right to knowledge, not ideas about effects. We are sure that knowledge is always better than ignorance. And we believe that everyone has a right to knowledge and to pleasure. So it's like this guy, I mean, it's just so great. I, I mean, not ideas about effects. It's like, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, and then I found another letter um, in, in a similar uh, kind of exchange, American and Swede. And the Swede writes back saying, the effects of sex ed, to be honest, have never been studied in Sweden. <laughs> We've acted out of the philosophy that children always have the right to honest answers to their questions that knowledge never hurts if given in a humane atmosphere, and that children, most of all, have a right to their own sexuality. And this is really interesting, too, because so many of the stories that we told about 20th century comparative politics and history are all about how, like, America's about individual rights, and over in Sweden, like, everyone drives a Volvo because they have a very strong, you know, you know, welfare state, okay, and everyone's very socially minded. I find all of this really interesting and counterintuitive, right? We're talking about the social consequences, right? But they are talking about individual rights. Um, uh, well, th this, this view, the Swedes are, are um, I mean, they're evangelists about it. It's amazing. I mean, I've got Swedes in Tunisia in 1969. I've got Swedes in, in Chile in 1971. I mean, it, it, it's astonishing. And, and it got some traction, especially in international organizations like WHO, um, International Planned Parenthood Federation, which for a long time was led by a Swede. Um, uh, in the so-called third world, well, very different. Um, uh, first of all, you should know that, especially in Africa, Asia, Latin America, <coughs> there's very little 
pre-AIDS that could fairly be called sex education. When it does happen, it's sponsored by religious organizations. If you read Innocence Abroad, if you're so lucky, um, uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see that in many of these countries, the church had a very big hand in public education. Um, uh, and and uh, it's sponsored by religious organizations. Uh, I, I spent a half year in Ghana in 2008, so I was able to gather a lot of stuff there. And sex ed began from the Christian Council of Ghana. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's linked very strongly to um, independence and nationalism in the 60s. Uh, and here's a, a sample quote, undisciplined children grow into undisciplined adults, irresponsible alike in their national and personal loyalties. The marriage bed should be without wrinkles. Boy and girl should be virgins at the time of marriage. This is a national duty and a holy one. Um, well, especially in the late 60s, this thing called the sex revolution, some people think it was a global sex revolution. Um, we didn't invent this globalization thing. They didn't have satellite TV, but they certainly had TV and radio. Um, uh, uh, and, and sex ed is promoted in the West by people like Calderon as, as, as a way to channel and control the sex revolution. But in the third world, it's, it's a consequence. It's a bitter fruit of the sex revolution, okay? It's not a way to rein in the sex revolution. It's yet another illustration of it. So I got this Sikhist guy in Japan in 1972. This was a stroke of luck, too. And he's trying to sell them on sex ed. And he writes to a friend at home, the weight of tradition seems oppressive. And since the Orient is older, its traditions may bear down even more heavily than in America. Many of my suggestions were countered with the argument that, quote, we can't do it that way in our culture. We can't do it that way in our culture. So um, Americans, led by the Ford Foundation, the Pop Council, they develop a new euphemism to try to promote sex education overseas. Um, we tried family life education. Now we're going to try something else. We're going to call it population education. Population education. Now remember, many of these countries, especially India, have very, very deeply developed family planning apparatuses. But the very term family planning refers to adults, right? 11-year-olds don't plan families, right? That's something adults do. Um, the idea is to try to capitalize on the family planning ideology without really mentioning sex. So teach kids about the need for small families, not via sex, but via demography, economics, a little bit of environmental study. Um, if you mention sex, keep it sato sato. All right? Um, and of course, the Swedes throw a cow at this. And, and I, found, I found a great letter from a Swede um, criticizing Pop Ed, as it was called, population education. He says, I'm no believer in white lies. This amounts to traveling under a false trademark. Let's create a public Im image of the IPPF, that's the International Planned Parenthood Federation, as an organization um, uh, that promotes Planned Parenthood for reasons of individual health and well-being in the conviction that man, sick, has a fundamental right to knowledge about himself. Um, well, if you look at international efforts in the 70s and the 80s, you do see the influence of this line of argument, especially the World Health Organization. Um, I, I want to get to Geneva, and I haven't yet, but I found a lot of cool WHO stuff that show the influence of, if you will, this Scandinavian line of argument. This is 1982, um, WHO. Sexuality is beginning to be recognized as a new value, independent of reproduction, as an important variable in the quality of life. Now listen to this. It's not possible to define the totality of human sexuality in a way that would be acceptable to all countries. But every person has a right to receive sexual information and, and to consider accepting sexual relationships for pleasure as well as procreation. <laughs> there's a lot in here, okay? And there's like a contradiction that a third grader could drive a truck through, okay? <laughs> We're not gonna try to define human sexuality in a way that would be acceptable to all countries. But what we say is every person has a right to like pleasure. I mean, does every country believe that? Clearly not. Uh, um, I, I, sexually starts at birth, if not earlier in the fetus. Masturbation and sex play are normal and healthy, yada, yada. Um, uh, but children in most countries suffer from sexual repression. <laughs> right? I mean, like, like, that's one of those boo words, right? Nobody says, you know, John Zimmerman. Sexual repressor. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> All right. Um, 
and, and, then, and then in the same WHO thing, I found all of this both fascinating and troubling and bizarre. Um, quote, by 1995, this is their target, right? Because you have to have a target. In every country, at least 80% of the people will have an opportunity of leading an emotionally satisfying sexual life. <laughs> My friends, what is that? I have no idea. And why 80%? Like, why not 81? Right? Or 77? Right? I mean, where do we get this kind of quasi mystical 80? Um, uh, uh, and then in, in Cairo in 1994, um, there's a big conference on population there. It's very much of a watershed because, um, in a way, all the, the, the world community signed on to a version of this. Um, uh, uh, we must focus not just on reducing fertility, but rather on the sexual and reproductive rights of the individual. Um, well, the age of AIDS, okay, and, the, and uh, uh, what you see is you do see almost every country um, uh, doing some kind of what could fairly be called sex education, um, uh, but it's a deeply conservative version, much closer to the kind of consequentialist model in the United States. Um, uh, you also see within all of these different societies, all the ones I've been able to find, profound resistance to any form of school-based sex education. Um, when it does exist, again, it's much closer to the George W. Bush model um, uh, than to anything else. Um, uh, and it spawns huge, huge controversy and, yes, cultural objections. Oh, you multiculturalists out there, all you purveyors of you know the other and the subaltern, okay? You got to know that the subaltern was not into sex ed, all right? The first place you can see that is in Europe in the Muslim populations. Why? Because in the Muslim countries they don't have sex ed yet, right? Um, but in places like England they do. Um, so these are uh, British Muslims in 1994 about the you know the Cairo Declaration. Quote: The secular West has no right to impose its own failing culture which contradicts the teaching of Islam on the Muslims of the world. We reject the enslavement of women as safe sex objects. Um, in Sweden, uh, um, liberal sexual mores present a threat to Swedish Muslim. Evil is increasing and the good is suppressed. Back to the UK, the schools are trying to destroy the identity, culture, and language of the Muslim pupils. This is all about sex ed. UK in 2004, this one's really ugly, but it's important. This sensitive subject contravenes Islamic values of decency, modesty, and respect. Islam categorically forbids homosexual practices. Muhammad says you should kill the one who does it and the one to whom it is done. We think it is wrong to discuss homosexuality in the schools in the same way that theft is wrong or murder is wrong. If people had all followed the way of life of Islam, no one would have suffered or died of AIDS. Um, and then the UK in 2009, Muslim parents are arrested for withdrawing their kids during LGBT week. Um, and and uh, their spokesman said, quote, this is not education, this is cultural fascism. Muslims who believe homosexuality is a sin are labeled as extremists. Liberal totalitarianism is a growing phenomenon in Britain and in the West in general. I love that. <laughs> um, can't make this up. Um, liberal totalitarianism. Um, uh, we must protect children's morals and values from the growing agenda to impose liberal values upon them. And then as versions of sex ed start to seep into other countries, we see um, objections by other religions, Catholic, Hindu, and Jewish. Um, in Israel, ministers from the National Religious Party um, uh, uh, object to AIDS being discussed in, in, in the state religious schools. Um, in India, the BJP, which is their kind of right-wing nationalist organization, um, they say sex ed is, is anti-Hindu, quote, we should teach yoga instead. That's really weird and interesting. <laughs> yes. No sex ed, please. Yoga. Um, uh, um, uh, they, they say we should stop aping Western culture in the school syllabus. Um, the socialists and the communists join in this attack, which I think is really interesting. Student groups burn sex ed books across North India. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, they say that the states are teaching sex ed just to get money from UNICEF and UNESCO. Um, and then my favorite India quote, I was there this summer, um, uh, one of these BJP guys says, sex education has made some strange bedfellows. The assorted acolytes of Hindu, Islamic, and Christian fundamentalist organizations, united by their faith, have succeeded in stalling the introduction of sex ed in at least seven states. Now, the strange bedfellow thing, I think, is, is really going to be the coda, at least to this talk, and in some ways to the book, which is 
even though the opposition to sex ed is often phrased in, in very nationalistic terms, like this didn't come from us, from our nation, <coughs> right? Um, it actually spawns an international movement of people opposed to sex ed. Uh, uh, in this great day of globalization, you can globalize anything, including the movement against sex ed. So after this Cairo Declaration in 1994, Pat Buchanan, of all people, uh, you know, Reagan speechwriter and president of wannabe, um, he writes this column saying, while this may be a bold agenda at Washington dinner parties, to traditional societies in Latin America, Africa, and the Islamic world, it is the essence of decadent, godless Western materialism. Um, he's on to something there. Obviously, he's painting with a very broad brush. Um, uh, as, as the students and I talked about earlier today, each of these societies are themselves irreducibly diverse, but there are certainly lots of people in Latin America, Africa, and the Islamic world who agree very much with Patrick Buchanan. So in Kenya in 1995, there's an anti-sex ed protest that culminates in the public burning of condoms in a square in Nairobi. Um, family life education, which is what they called it, thanks to some American influence and dollars, is withdrawn. In 2004, there's a World Congress of Families that meets in Mexico City. What is it? It's international pro-family alliance transcending national borders, cultures, and faith traditions. It's all people who oppose sex ed. Um, they read a letter of welcome from George W. Bush. Um, in the United Kingdom in 2004, there's a, there's a US style chastity tour where uh, people wear this silver ring saying that they can be, they're, they're now, what is it, technical version, I guess? I, I'm just gonna call myself a technical version. <laughs> like, I guess anyone can, um, or a secondary version. Um, uh, and, and in Ghana, where I was in 2007, 2008, whenever I open up the newspaper, you start thinking about a subject, it's like when you learn a new word and you see it everywhere. You know, it's like, whoa, you know, everyone's talking about this. Um, but um, all kinds of interesting articles blasting, quote, Western sex education. Uh, quote, families are in turmoil and most parents are so scared that they're willing to condescend to purchase condoms for their children. Our children are practicing fornication um, and we're conniving at this by giving them every encouragement to do this. The school should not be doing so. Um, uh, Uganda, 2008, uh, girls are, quote, expressing their sexuality in erotic ways for the whole world to see. We need sex ed, to, sex ed to teach youth a new way, especially the young girls whose sexuality has become part of the problem. Right, right to sexuality, I think not. Please understand, I'm not saying in any way that I endorse this, all right? Um, I, I, but what's interesting, and, and this will be my, and then I'm actually gonna stop talking, is how this argument too gets phrased in terms of rights. A right is a trump card, all right? It's my right. And remember, in this European model, each individual is embodied, literally and figuratively, with sexual rights. But the opponents invoke rights, too, in two ways. First of all, they, too, invoke children's rights, rights to innocence, right? This is Ireland, 1997. We see this as a violation of a child's right to its childhood, right? That's an argument about child rights as well. Um, uh, UK, 2008, what would possess a responsible adult to talk about this with a five-year-old? A child's innocence is a precious thing. It should not be sold to satisfy a government target. That's an argument about child's rights too, very different argument. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, invoking parental rights. Um, one of the things I find fascinating is that on the right, both in Europe and the United States, everyone hates the UN, except the part in the Universal Declaration of Rights that says that parents have a prior right to choose the kind of education that their kids should have. <laughs> Everyone in the right invokes that when it's in there. You look at all the UN charters, right? There is this line about parental rights. You see that all over this literature. Um, uh, UK 69, teachers should teach simple sex as part of biology class and leave the rest to parents. We parents are quite capable of doing the jobs ourselves in spite of what anti-BBC, there were sex ed came from BBC, and the experts think. Um, uh, UK 71, one question of rights, which doesn't appear to induce much agitation among these professed defenders of civil liberties, is the right to, of parents to bring up their own children as they think best. That's an argument about rights, too. Now, what's the response here? Um, well, we'll go back to Sweden. Uh, this is the Swedish sex ed organization in 2004, a pamphlet called A Passion for Rights. Isn't that great? A Passion for Rights. Um, uh, quote, how can sexuality and reproduction and a health perspective based on individual rights become a global norm? That's the question. How can sexuality, reproduction, and health perspective based on individual rights become a global norm, i.e., we want it to be one? Um, well, 
I don't know if it can or even if it should, uh, but I hope my book will help me figure that out, and I hope that you will help me do it. Thank you very much. are arguably much less important than the Zimmermans of the world say, they are our major public institution for deliberating and transmitting ideas to the young. So they're not the only institution that does it, but they are a major public institution that does that. And that does make them distinct. Um, uh, yes, yeah, sir? Uh, you quoted a number of um, Islamic sources in your, in your letters and, and correspondence. Did you find an overwhelming uh, large proportion of, of Islamic conservatives, or was there perhaps an equal, if not like, because I usually hear about the Christian conservatives in this country who are talking against sex education. What, did they have anything interesting to say? The Christian or, conservatives? Yeah. Hugely so. And in fact, they're making cause with the Islamic ones. That the, the, the interesting <laughs> distinctions here might not be between country A and country B. Um, it might be between the orthodox believers in country A and country B, who have joined hands, and the non-orthodox. Uh, uh, if you look at my book, Who's America? Um, and if you read that book, you'll actually become the first person who's not a blood relative to do so. Um, uh, you'll find that, that I talk about, uh, it, there's a good deal of focus on the Christian conservatives in this country. And one of the things I find so fascinating is at the very moment where some Christian conservatives are wringing their hands about the Islamicization of this or that, they're also joining hands with Orthodox Muslims on the question of sex ed. Uh, and that I find fascinating. What are current sort of policies about sex ed and whether it is in public schools, is it a national requirement? And then my second question, I guess to go along with that, Well, um, all, all great questions. And when I was talking about Sweden being the first country to require it as a nation, I should have clarified that we don't require anything as a nation. We don't have a national curriculum. Um, you could argue that implicitly we do in terms of textbooks and certain other practices, but there's no official curriculum. I mean, when I taught in France, I was quite amazed that at least in theory, on any given day, everyone in grade six is supposed to be learning the same thing. Um, uh, and, and in June, by the way, there's a day called Fromage Day, Cheese Day, where all the sixth graders are supposed to learn about great French cheeses. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't have that. And, and to, go to, your, to go to the second part of your question about the current status of sex ed, it's very hard to figure out. Why? Because we have 15,000 school districts. Um, uh, so it's so hard to generalize about anything. Um, but the people who have counted all this stuff, 
um, ha ha have found that um, uh, sex ed in the country, um, because it's so highly contested, to go to the other part of your question, tends to emphasize the biological and the physiological over the emotional. Um, this is what detractors call plumbing lessons. Um, <coughs> most kids report getting some kind of sex ed, the overwhelming majority do, but it's extremely limited, not just in scope, but also in time. I saw a study recently suggesting that the average kid in high school gets six hours of sex ed a year. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's another reason sex ed is so fascinating because the battles over it are just way more voluminous than the subject itself, right? I mean, think of all the airtime that our battles over sex ed get compared to how much sex ed actually happens. Um, uh, uh, it, it, there, there's, let's just say, a disproportion there. Um, so clearly the amount of sex ed has gone up, especially in the, in, in the era of AIDS. Um, but mom is right at some level, it's much less than in most European countries. Um, and because it's so controversial, well, it tends to be denuded of controversy, uh, which is the safest bet, and it is. I mean, this is one of the great ironies of living in a democracy, um, uh, is that often the most small-d democratic thing to do is to strip anything remotely controversial from the democratic school curriculum, lest you offend one constituency or another. Um, you know, this is why school books remain so foreign, right? The problem with our school books is not that they're right, right wing or left wing, although of course people on the right and the left will tell you that. It's that they're neither. Um, they're stripped of anything remotely perspectival. Um, just the facts, yawn. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sir? Oh, this part's really interesting, and I, I, I could go on forever about the U.S. and China. Um, all right. Interesting uh, slip there, the USSR and China. Um, very briefly in response to the question. They're, they're, they're fascinating for different reasons. Um, uh, very briefly, when Lenin was still at the helm, um, the, 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 uh, um, Lenin famously said that we should uh, uh, teach that sex is no more or no less important than drinking a glass of water. Um, and for a very brief time, there was a kind of sexual, almost libertarianism that got into Soviet schools. But as soon as Stalin came in, all of that went away. Um, and indeed, the whole idea of sex education was rejected as a kind of you know, bourgeois thing from the West. Um, uh, and and um, uh, after the end of the Cold War, um, they, they did institute a version of sex ed briefly in the, in, in the 90s, after the wall came down. Uh, and, and then um, these, these nascent Russian Orthodox groups and nationalist groups put the kibosh on it. Um, again, saying it was this decadent thing that came from the West, you know, it doesn't match our history and our culture. The Chinese example, in some ways, is even more amazing, and here's why. Like it or not, China has created the most elaborate, the <coughs> most restrictive, and one could argue, the most draconian system of planned reproduction in human history. It's just an astonishing and amazing thing. But the same country that instituted this extremely rigid um, system of family planning, when they proposed sex ed, when Joe and Mai proposed sex ed, there were all these letters in the newspaper, in a country that doesn't exactly like to encourage a lot of dissent, saying, oh my god, our schools could never do that. The kids would laugh at us. Um, and, and the state promulgates sex ed, but doesn't enforce it. If the Chinese wanted sex ed in every school, they could have it tomorrow. All right? Um, this is less the case now than it was you know, during the time of Joe and Mai and Mao. But they could have. So they passed requirements saying that we should have sex ed. Um, and this happened when AIDS broke, especially. And then they didn't enforce it, which is really really fascinating and interesting. Um, so the city of Shanghai had this very elaborate uh, sex ed requirement and curriculum, and then when anthropologists went out there to study it, they found that, lo and behold, the schools weren't teaching it. Uh, uh, yeah? Um, I was wondering, uh, I know it's very bad to whether you've seen any trends on what age most kids get sex education, and maybe why that's either better or now? Well, Again, it depends on where you're talking about. You know, um, uh, the Swedes begin very young, 
you know, so do a lot of other countries in Europe. It also depends on what the it is, right? I mean, one of the problems, you know, that I, I've been scribbling here is what exactly is sex ed? That is, what's included in that term, right? I mean, is a book that shows a family sex ed? I, I think in some ways it is, right? You know, um, it's certainly teaching a sexual norm, but if by sex ed we mean, and I'm going to try to limit it this way, because again, you've got to draw a line somewhere, um, uh, education about the sexual act, its meaning, and its consequences. To me, that's what sex ed is. You know, I know we get sexual messages from everything, blah, 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 right? But if you're talking about that, you know, I think it's fair to say that it's still a junior high school and high school thing, right? Um, uh, not so in Sweden, not so in Finland or Norway, definitely in the U.S. and the U.K. And by the way, the U.K. turns out to be more like the U.S. than any other European country. Um, the number of newspaper articles I've found with the headline, no sex please, were British. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it just goes on and on. Um, uh, but, but for us, it's a junior, it's a junior high and, 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 a, and a senior high. Well, you know, there's a, there's, there, there's a great literature about this, and I can emphasize that there's cross-fertilization, to use a loaded metaphor, in both directions, right? It's not like the United States has the only eugenics, or even if the United States invented eugenics, because, of course, people like Galton and, you know, everybody else in Britain and Germany, they were, they were way into this, you know, and mo most of the founders, really, I would argue, the intellectual founders were European rather than American. I think, I think though, you know, it's really important to understand that to say somebody in 1909 believes in eugenics is not a remarkable thing. It's more remarkable if they don't. Um, uh, that is, it was a fully accredited progressive idea, both on the continent and in the United States. And yes, it lay at the heart of the family planning movement, both, both in the United States and in Europe. Margaret Sanger, my favorite Margaret Sanger quote, more children from the fit, less from the unfit. This is the message of birth control. <laughs> yeah. More from the fit, less from the unfit. This doesn't make her weird or different. It makes her out of her time. Um, as, you might, as you might guess, I, I, I love watching shows like The 700 Club. And, and, and if you'll see, at least once a year, Pat Robertson will quote what I just said. Okay? Um, now, he's right. If Robertson's assertion is that eugenics lay at the heart of the early family planning movement on the continent of the United States, he's right. Now, it doesn't therefore follow that there shouldn't be you know, government assistance to family planning today. That's a fallacy, right? But Robertson's right about the history, and you've got a deal, right? And what that means is you have to scrutinize your own thinking to see the degree to which it reflects your own eugenic heritage. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm wondering, did you did you a little bit more about, or do you know a little bit more about where exactly the Swedish view of the right sort of oriented view comes from? Because you commented that it's sort of Milesian, but in a, in a certain sense, our system seems Milesian, maybe even more so because it's a consequence. Sort of yeah, that was thing. definitely the wrong metaphor. Yeah, I, was, um, yeah, I, was yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is no, and 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 I think the reason is I'm still, God, I'm still trying to teach myself about all these countries. I mean, there are a lot of them. You know, I, I've been looking. There are maybe like 190. Uh, Gunnar Myrdal, uh, who was very famous, came to America to write about race. He and his wife wrote about uh, um, sex ed in the 20s, 30s, and 40s at great length. And, and part of it is, is actually an effort to, um, uh, in their view, improve the population, not necessarily in the eugenic sense, because the Myrdals only go in for that. Right? But improve the population because they said, and the Myrdals, I mean, it's interesting, you know, a wanted child is better for society than an unwanted one. You can still hear this today. Uh, fascinating argument. Um, uh, but it had a very, very Swedish genesis. Um, uh, but but, but where, where the idea of rights, a right to sexuality came from in the Scandinavian con context, I, I, I am still looking. You know, and trying in my weird spare moments, you know, to um, uh, you know to read what I can. I mean, it, it when you do a project like this, I mean, I, I, I experienced that with Innocence Abroad too. <coughs> You're constantly confronted by your ignorance. You know, I mean, Will Rogers said we're all ignorant only about different things. You know, and that's just totally true. You know, and one of the things I do whenever I begin a course, 
it, it's, is I always draw a big line across the blackboard, you know, and, and I say, okay, this is what, imagine a big line, I, I say, this is what there is to know about whatever, you know, the history of American education, okay? I'm here, and you're here. <laughs> do I know more than you? Well, let's hope so. I mean, it's what I do. They're paying me, right? But compared to what there is to know, jack. I know jack, all right? Nothing. So when I was doing this abroad, I'm in an archive one day, and, and I, I find these boxes. Um, I, 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 was, I, I was really interested in Korea at the time, and there's a lot of Korea in my book. I find these boxes, they say, chosen, C-H-O-S-E-N. I'm like, whoa, what is this? Like, were there Jews in Korea? <laughs> right? Um, you know, you know, you're like, what's going on? And then I find, lo and behold, the Japanese renamed the country. Um, my, my stamp collector nerd friends all know this, because apparently, like, the stamps from that time that say Kosan are really valuable. I had no idea. They renamed the whole damn country. Uh, I had no clue. Uh, so there's a lot about which I have no clue. Um, we have time for one more question before we go outside. I, yes, I had a question. Well, it's a great question. <coughs> right. It's a great question. Again, it's a very American question, right? Because it is about consequences, right? It's yeah. Uh, nothing we can do about that, right? Um, here, 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 here's what here's what we know. Um, uh, what we know is that most of what's called abstinence-only education doesn't work. And when I say it doesn't work, is it doesn't do what it, it, its explicit objective is, right? And um, it's one of the few things we've been able to show, right? You take a thousand kids, right? You expose them to absent only ed, take a thousand, try to control for everything else. Turns out that, you know, the first group is no more likely to abstain from sex. But in response to the gentleman's question, please understand the following. Just because abstinence only education works doesn't mean the like Mary Calderon minted comprehensive sex ed does. Right? All my liberal friends rejoicing when these numbers came out, but extrapolating in the most fallacious and political ways, right? Because this doesn't work, our kind does, very little evidence. It's really hard to show. It's there, but very tenuous, right? So just because the other guy's kind doesn't work, and again, we're talking about consequences, doesn't mean that yours does. Turns out that sexual behavior is a really complicated and weird thing, and really, really hard to affect. We have shown that sex ed can change people's attitudes. We have shown that it can change their knowledge, right? And not, you know, I'm a big believer in that, by the way. I mean, I'm in the knowledge business. You know, the beginning of Animal House, we see the president, right? He says, knowledge is good, right? <laughs> I'm into that, right? So you, you can defend it on those grounds, right? But do not kid yourself into thinking that your kind works because we do not have that evidence, right? And it's all about what works, right? We're in America, right? Yeah. Thank you very much.